Okay, Amy, I think we're on the way. Hi, this is Glenn Lowry. This is the Glenn Show, sponsored by the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research in New York City. And I'm with um, Amy Wax, my friend uh, and uh, colleague, partner in crime here in the transgressive, uh, heterodox world of critiquing wokeness. Notorious figure at the University of Pennsylvania and the subject of... uh, disciplinary action that's been initiated by her dean, um, about which we'll have a good deal more to say. Uh, But I welcome you back to The Glenn Show, Amy. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Nice to see you. Amy Wax is professor at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. She's the author of articles and books on legal and social policy questions uh, and has been a frequent guest here at The Glenn Show. Uh, As you know, Amy... You're controversial, and when you appear at the Glenn Show, I become controversial. No, just kidding. I'm already controversial. <laughs> but you're on the you in the hot seat. You, you, you're you're on. Uh, it it would appear to me to be in uh, the crosshairs uh, there at the University of Pennsylvania. Do you want to just get us started by explaining a little bit about the disciplinary action which your dean, Dean Ted Ruger, has initiated? Uh, with a petition to the faculty senate at the University of Pennsylvania that you should be, a hearing should be convened. uh, And the subject of that hearing would be your your behavior as a professor and a member of the faculty. And that sanctions, major sanctions, if I get that correct, uh, should be considered against you. Um, You want to set the stage a little bit? Okay, well, it is a long history and I don't want to bore your listeners here, but It goes back several years that I made a series of statements and also uh, some written materials that various people at Penn have objected to loudly and vociferously as the years go by. Uh, It all started with an innocuous op-ed in 2017 praising bourgeois values. Uh, It went on to include some comments I made on your blogging heads where we had a conversation about affirmative action, and I suggested that uh, black students sometimes have trouble keeping up. Uh, This was considered bizarrely an outrageous statement. Uh, There are other statements that I've made about uh, voting patterns, immigration. I won't go into the details, but the grievances have accumulated and people have called for my head. The reaction these days under the woke regime seems to be fire her, fire her, she's a racist, you know, very primitive and unsophisticated way of dealing with dissent and controversy. Uh, But more and more, the administration of these universities just kind of goes along with it, doesn't push back in any way. And that's what's happened at my university, my dean, who initially defended my right to express my opinion as he should and as the basic commitments of academic freedom require, uh, and also my tenure contract, uh, reversed course uh, earlier this year under pressure, pressure from politicians, people who have no business uh, deciding university policy, of course, but pressure from students, from some alumni on the left side of the spectrum and promised that he would seek major sanctions against me, implement formal proceedings against me. What for? Really for my speech, for my opinions. I mean, it really is nothing more and nothing less. But of course, in this sinister transmogrification, he tries to depict my speech, my opinions, my positions as some strange kind of behavioral violation that undermines the mission or the values of the university, whatever that means. Uh, And therefore he has filed a series of charges against me, a kind of long Mikado like laundry list of indictments, uh, called me every name in the book, racist, sexist, white supremacist, which is laughable of course and then decided to refer my case to the faculty senate uh, for, as you suggested, major sanctions. And major sanctions could be anything from, you know, a slap on the wrist to taking away my job. And where things stand now, where things stand is that the faculty senate now uh, is poised to consider 
this request. There is supposed to be some kind of hearing uh, at some point. Prior to the hearing, I am about to file a major um, letter request asking for all sorts of information and data on many of the charges because, of course, the faculty handbook guarantees me fundamental fairness. Fundamental fairness does require that I be able to defend myself. Uh, and so that sort of is going to be the first step in the process. Uh, and we'll see what happens. But I think the really important thing to take away from this um, is that there is an attempt underway to punish me, penalize me, strip me of tenure, take away my position at Penn pure, for pure speech and expression of opinions. There is no credible allegation that I have exercised bias or discriminated against anyone. Uh, in fact, there was an internal investigation about a year ago by an outside person that I was, was hidden from me for eight months. They didn't even tell me about it, uh, that it had been filed, that explicitly found that there was no evidence that I had exercised bias towards anyone. The students had alleged that they had a good reason to fear I would grade them in a discriminatory way. The investigation said, well, wait, we have blind grading at Penn Law School. That isn't possible. And there's no evidence that she's breached this blind grading policy. So that's nonsensical. But of course, none of these, you know, little exercises in logic and analysis make it into the documents. Uh, they are just a flurry of non sequiturs, nonsense, illogic. Uh, and okay, you know, okay, Amy. Accusation. Let me share a I'm little sorry, bit with I'm the audience. On and on. I've said enough. No, no. No, that, that's okay. I mean, you, you <laughs> have every right to uh, feel the way you do about being the uh, target of this and to, uh, you know, express your uh, strenuous objection to the process that you've been entangled in. But I want people who are listening to this conversation to get a little bit of the flavor of what Dean Ruger is accusing you of. Uh, so let me quote a little bit from his letter to the chair of the uh, University of Pennsylvania Faculty Senate uh, requesting the hearing process that you just got through describing. Wax has shown a callous and flagrant disregard for our university community, including faculty and staff, who have been repeatedly subjected to Wax's intentional and incessant racist, sexist, xenophobic, and homophobic actions and statements. Wax's conduct inflicts harm on them and the institution and undermines the university's core values. Wax has made these statements in the classroom and on campus, in other academic settings and in public forums in which she has ident been identified as a University of Pennsylvania professor. Her statements are antithetical to the university's mission to foster a diverse, inclusive community and have led students and faculty to reasonably believe that they will be subjected to discriminatory animus if they come into contact with her. That eminently reasonable concern has led students to conclude that they cannot take Wax's classes and faculty to call her uh, presence demoralizing and disruptive. Moreover, and I'll just go on one more moment, in public discussions about law students' academic performance, Wax has disseminated false information about segments of the university community. She has exploited access to students' confidential grade information and mischaracterized law school policies in ostensible support of derogatory and inaccurate statements made about the characteristics, attitudes, and abilities of her students. As a result of Wax's derogatory and misleading statements, students who have taken her classes have expressed anxiety that they will be accused of being at the bottom of their class since a number of minority students in her classes is finite and, finite and easily identifiable. Her conduct threatens to cause a chilling effect on students who have chosen to forgo enrollment in her classes due to a concern that they will be treated more harshly and unfairly relative to their white peers. In addition, her conduct is antithetical to the university's core mission to attract a diverse student body to an inclusive educational environment. It goes on, obviously, um, but um, that is, it seems to me, the heart of the matter. 
uh, people are made to feel unwelcome and insecure by the expressions of your opinions that you are alleged to have made. Uh, and the university's reputation is besmirched and undermined by your conduct in public, both on campus and, and outside of it. And um, I just wanted to lay that out there, Amy, and uh, give you an opportunity to respond. Well, I mean, there is so much palaver and cheap talk in that set of accusations. I wouldn't know where to start. I mean, first of all, they've repeatedly accused me of speaking falsely about student performance. They have the data. They have never produced that data to back up their accusations of speaking falsely. And they I am going to request that data. They are going to have to produce that data. And if they don't, then this is gross unfairness. You cannot accuse someone of you know, false statements and not prove it. I mean, this is like 101. This is basic due process. Uh, so that I, I just want people to, excuse me for interrupting, a, excuse me. I just want people to know what you're talking about. Um, in a public conversation that you and I conducted a few years ago, you stated that it was rare in your experience to see a black student in your um, civil procedure uh, class uh, in the top half and very rare in the top quarter of the student performance in that class. If I don't quote you correctly, please correct me. But words to that effect, that's what he's talking about. Your public statement that black students were on the whole not doing particularly well academically in your experience at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. That's right, and that was based mainly on my civil procedure class, which I've taught for 20 years. And that data is there, and it's out there, okay? And they have it. And of course, they have data on every first year blind graded class. And I've talked to other professors in private. They won't go public about it. And they've said things like, oh yeah, my black students are in the top half at the rate of one tenth of what you'd expect, or even less than that. Um, I've had this confirmed by people over and over, but once again, the dean just agree, you know, blatantly denies it. Let me just say on the confidentiality point. I mean, the dean has said, "Oh no, it's false. Our students do, our black students do just as well as our white students." Well, that's a confidentiality violation too. I mean. If you say things that are unwelcome, that's no more confidenti confidentiality violation or less than saying things that you know people want to hear. So that's completely illogical, right, and unreasonable. But let's just leave that's that a good aside. Point. He's also uh, so those that supposedly it, false statements need to prove the other stuff. You know, oh, she's a racist. She's a sexist. You know, she can't say derogatory things. That's hurtful, that's harmful. I mean, think about this, uh, Glenn. Define racist, define sexist. They just decide that certain political, moral, cultural critiques and comments of, you know, the values and the policies they favor are off limits now. I mean, where does this rule come from? You can't say derogatory things about what your university is doing. You can't criticize what your university is up to. That is a made up rule. It is totally made up. And if it's taken seriously, it is the death of academic freedom, the death of dissent. It imposes this pall of orthodoxy, which of course, you know, can be defined and redefined at any time uh, and then retroactively applied on every member of the university. And I just say that is illegitimate and it is completely unwise as well. What this boils down to, Glenn, is the reactions of students, mainly untutored reactions and fears that have no basis that are completely made up to get back at and bully people and faculty that they disagree with, those reactions now have been elevated to paramount unquestioned status. And what's really going on, let me just step back, 
and give you the overview, Glenn, and tell me if you agree with this. The private universities are making this big play to consolidate the absolute control of far left woke ideology over our most prestigious universities. They want to banish and punish and exclude anyone who is a cuckoo in the nest, who dares to dissent, who dares to expose students to different ideas. And these are ideas that are commonplace out there in the real world. I mean, I go to gatherings all the time where ideas and notions and objections are expressed on a routine basis that would never be allowed in the university and that the university is determined to banish altogether. Okay, and I just think that is a really dangerous and pernicious trend, but I am now this warrior, this culture warrior, this uh, kind of roadkill in this process. Uh, one of the few, because I'm one of the few who's actually willing to, to speak out. Everybody else at this point is completely intimidated. Okay, the let, students let me tell, tell you, me this on a routine basis. Let, let me tell you some of what I think anyway. Um, I mean, I'm comparing your case on the question of student performance uh, by race to that of the lecturer at the Georgetown Law Center, Sandra Sellers, who was cashiered, she's a lecturer without right. tenure, for casually in what she thought was a private conversation, sharing with a colleague her concerns about black students concentrating at the bottom of her negotiations class that she was teaching there at Georgetown. There was a furor that was engendered by that, and uh, she was fired by the dean. She didn't have tenure. And her associate to whom she was speaking was also fired, even though he didn't say anything. He was fired or decided to leave uh, under duress because uh, he didn't correct, quote unquote, her report of the facts about student performance and her experience. So these, these are similar cases. And here's what I think. Um, I guess there are two things I think. One of them is you got affirmative action. It's going to have consequences. So affirmative action means you're using different criteria for selecting students from underrepresented groups, black and Latino mainly. Lower LSAT uh, threshold uh, and uh, less exacting uh, GPA requirements. You're using lower academic credentials to admit the students in the underrepresented population. That's point one. Point two, the academic credentials are relevant to how the students perform after admissions. Otherwise, you wouldn't be using them at all. You wouldn't use them to choose amongst the white students or the Asian students if you didn't think they actually had information in them. So the LSAT score and the GPA coming in are predictive of how students are going to do after the fact. And you're using lower thresholds to admit the underrepresented minority group students. Therefore, the population that you receive after admission is on average less qualified than those who are uh, not preferred in the admissions process. That's definitional. Okay, so when those differences in qualifications manifest themselves in the classroom, as they inevitably will do, circumstances such as that, which you reported, I'm assuming that your report is accurate. I wasn't there, but I'll take your word for it. Or that Sandra Seller reported are to be expected. Now, the people who say something that they observe with their own eyes, which is the predictable consequence of the policy, are being called racist and being said to shut up because we don't want that information being out there in the discussion. Now, I, I understand this. I mean, because I have made this speech, the speech that I'm making to you right now in my own classroom talking to a mixed group of students, I'm African-American, you're not, maybe I've given a, given a little bit more leeway for that. But as far as I can see, this is just logic. There's, there's no moral judgment in it. I'm merely stating the obvious implications of the policy. And students have asked me, does that mean you think I don't belong here? That's exactly some of the complaint that your dean is... Uh, is pointing to about how students feel when confronted with uh, with this evidence, with this observation. And 
I've always answered that, no, I'm not saying that you don't belong. I'm saying, however, that on average, there will be these differences in performance if there are differences in the predictive thing. And that's something that if we're going to follow this policy, we have to accept. My view would be mindful of that implication of the policy. Let's ensure that we support the students after they get here in such a way that we don't have to paper over and hide from uh, the consequences of the differences on average across the racial groups in, in, their, in their preparation. But it's tough. It, it's very tough when the student is standing in front of me, dewy-eyed and trembling in effect and saying, please don't tell me, Professor Lowry, that you're saying because I'm black, I don't belong in this prestigious institution. And I'm, I'm just uh, asking whether or not, I'm asking you now, whether or not having uh, made the first observation that I made, you give any credence to the concern about the impact of that on uh, the students of color whom you may encounter in, in your classroom or outside of it. Well, Glenn, I mean, it is a hyper-emotional, loaded, manipulative thing to say that for a student to say to you, well, you're saying that as a black student, I don't belong here. I would reply to them. I mean, you know, in if things were as they should be, which is that we do ask students to be honest about the ramifications and implications of some of the policies they might favor. Uh, not as a black student, but it may be that on some level, you don't belong here. Depending on the criteria that we think are relevant for admitting people to certain schools. And that of course opens up a whole discussion about what the meritocracy is, why we would want meritocratic criteria, why we might want to modify them. To personalize it that way, you're saying I don't belong here, is just basically to shut down that kind of analytical conversation. And I do not think that's good for anyone. We are giving minority students a pass on rigor, on logic, on objectivity that we should not be giving them. They are allowed to personalize things, just to depict them as a tax on them. And we should be pushing back against that uh, and saying, grow up. This is not about you. This is not about belonging, whatever that means, unless you want to start analyzing how institutions should function and what their admissions criteria should be. It may be that on some very reasonable criteria, no, you don't belong here. You know, you have if you have a 550 math SAT, I am willing to say you don't belong at MIT. I don't care what color you are. You don't belong at MIT. So part of the problem is, Glenn, we have no one saying those things to students because we have university officials in this great inversion who are afraid of students. They are afraid to exercise their authority. They are afraid to correct their illogic and their hyper emotionality uh, and their solecisms. And that, I think, is a terrible situation. But if the something university, bigger is going on here. Hold on a minute, hold on a minute, Amy. If the university is going to bring a student in, and if at the end of the day they're going to say to the student, you don't belong here. Well, I mean, if my, they're going to bring My response in, to that, my response okay, to that is they see, shouldn't have I brought them in the first... No, no, hold on. Let me, just well, let right. me say what I want to say. Either they shouldn't have brought them in in the first place, or if they are there, they have to say to the students, look, here's a fact. You're overplaced relative to your classmates on some very important academic criteria. That's what affirmative action is. Because the students want to embrace affirmative action, but then they want to turn around and deny what affirmative action entails. Actually, I've gotten some of this in my accusations. Amy Wax dared to say to the student, well, you've benefited from affirmative action. Now, I actually never said that to a particular student, certainly not at the classroom. That's completely you were implausible. You accused, excuse, excuse me, Amy, Amy, excuse me just a minute. 
In the letter yeah. that Dean Ruger sent to the uh, chair of the faculty senate, you're accused of having told a student, the only reason you're a double IV is because of affirmative action, quote unquote. I have never said that to any student. In what class? What was the lesson? What was the context? Nothing is supplied. It's just this kind of fertile imagination that I said X. This was also a decade ago. Glenn, I received a university-wide teaching award in 2015. None of this stuff was ever alleged. None of it ever came out. How plausible student, is that? I never would have the gotten student the award. Who was quoted, the student who was quoted saying that you said that to her graduated in 2012 from the law school. Okay, that was before I got this award. My record was exhaustively reviewed. There's a whole file on me. If there was even a hint that I had said something objectionable, I never would have gotten it. So the whole thing is just implausible, okay? But let's let's just leave that aside. Suppose okay. that I had said that. Okay, here's the attitude of the students, the attitude of the university. We love affirmative action. It's absolutely essential. We can't do without it. If we don't have it, the number of black students will be a fraction of what it is. You can go to the Harvard case before the Supreme Court. The briefs say all of this stuff, yep. right? But on the other hand, nobody wants to admit that they're a beneficiary of affirmative action. They view it as an insult. So how do you reconcile, Glenn, these two statements? Well, they're completely contradictory, but you see, they don't care because contradiction you know, being consistent, being rigorous, being logical, that's whiteness, Glenn. That's whiteness. That's the stuff they want to get rid of. That is the actual priority here, unspoken. All of these standards, all of these requirements, intellectual integrity, consistency, analysis, rigor, okay, logic, evidence, get rid of it. If we want this person out, we can accuse her of anything. We can contradict ourselves all over the place. Have you heard the concept, Michael Anton's concept of parallax celebration? You know what I that not, is? I have not. Spell it out for okay. us. And by I'll the way, let me, just say, let, me, let me just okay. say this before you go on. I, w I just want to say this. I agree 100% mm -hmm. with the concerns that you've just been expressing about the uh, subtle underhandedness and corruption of affirmative action. It leads us to telling lies. And uh, the paradox that you just called attention to can't take away affirmative action, otherwise no blacks would be here, but there's no black person whom you can point to who is actually there because of affirmative action. It's just the tip of the iceberg, it seems to me here, with respect to how it is that using different standards for selecting people into highly competitive and elite venues corrupts the process of evaluating individual performance. I'll repeat myself. If you use a lower threshold on average, it's a statistical necessity that you're going to get lower performance if the criteria are correlated with the post-admissions performance. So now you've got what you could not help but get given how you're behaving. And then you're telling me, don't believe my lying eyes and shut up about it. That, that, that is, it seems to me, the corner that uh, they've got you painted into. You refuse to go along with the lie that there's nothing to see here. There are no issues here. Don't worry about it. And uh, as a result, you have to be hung out to dry. That's what I see. Well, I mean, the lie is even bigger than that. Okay. okay. And let me just quote Richard Hanania, who tweeted something very wise. He said... The problem with affirmative action is not that you let in some people who, you know, might be overplaced or aren't quite up to snuff. No, it's the effect it has on institutions and the distortions that it introduces in what people are allowed to say, the lies that they are forced to tell, the contradictions that they are forced to embrace. I mean, it's bigger than that, Glenn, in the following sense. You said, well, if you lower the criteria for admission, that is going to affect performance. Well, that's precisely what they're at pains to deny. The criteria mean nothing, okay? They're an illusion, they're, they're a tool for oppression. Performance, that's just this notion that, you know, 
that white people come up with to oppress minorities. It's meaningless. It's empty. It's it's just a ruse. You know, the, the whole meritocracy is is a joke. It needs to be abolished and demolished. That is the broader agenda. So all of these categories, all of these predictions, all of these correlations, they they can't be spoken of because they're just, you know, part of this whiteness conspiracy that we have to get rid of. I mean, this is a very, very broad and deep project, Glenn, that is growing. I mean, it, we are we are far along in advancing this project. And of course, there's huge duplicity and deceit here because on the one hand, we have all this palaver about excellence and you know achievement and all of that. But on the other hand, in the very same institutions, we have uh, this sneering at, uh, and this denigration. I'm sorry, that's my phone, ignore yeah, it. Yeah, it's okay. Um, th these things are happening simultaneously, Glenn. And you know, people like us are caught in this vise, uh, and we are we are the sacrificial lambs here. That's that's what's going on. <laughs> okay, I can anticipate objections to making ourselves. I'll include myself in that into victims when we are, in fact, uh, <laughs> very privileged and powerful people. We're tenured professors at Ivy League institutions. We, we live in big houses and we have a nice retirement account to, to fall back on. And the stormtroopers are not exactly at our door. So, <laughs> so but, but I hear you. I, I, I well, hear I'll you. Door, I'll okay, but Amy... My you kids give... have been trolled by my husband. No, they're on our door. Okay, okay I want you to address I, I mean, so, I haven't been fired yet. No, you haven't. And, and, one, and, I, and, and I doubt that you will. I, and, and, I doubt that you will. And if you do get fired, God help uh, that that doesn't happen. I don't want that to happen at all. But should it happen, uh, it'll be a signature case in the history of academic freedom in this country. It would be an outrage beyond belief that you would be relieved of your teaching responsibilities and the sinecure that you've earned because of your opinions, because you don't believe the, you haven't drunk the Kool-Aid, because you, you, know, you don't believe the hype, because you happen to have views. I mean, my view is, if she's wrong, refute her. It, that's, that's what you do. Uh, you don't tell her to shut up. You don't call her a name. You argue, okay? Okay, Glenn, well, let me say one thing about that. Of course, I 100% agree with you, but here's the thing. I mean, if if I'm, you know, stripped of tenure or whatever, uh, and I'm not saying that's going to happen, uh, but if it did, here's the question. And, and this goes to Penn's calculation, right? Which is, what can we get away with? Will anybody care? This is a really important question I am asking you, okay? Because right now, even though this is happening to me, people are still giving money to Penn, students are applying in record numbers. I think that these universities have become emboldened and their attitude right now is how many divisions does the Academic Freedom Alliance have? How much power does FIRE have? You know, it's sort of like Disney and Governor DeSantis. Uh, well, our stock is going up. So why should we stand down in the culture war? I really think we're at the point where these universities are so woke and so arrogant and so bold that their view is, uh, let's see what we can get away with. You know, will the alumni rebel? Will uh, the students rebel? Will the donors rebel? I mean, I think the government could rebel if, the Republicans get control, but I'm not even sure they'll do that. There are lots of things they could do, and we could discuss some of those things, right? But it requires political will. It requires leadership. It requires recognizing that this is a problem, a major problem. The far, far left control of the universities really is a crisis for our nation because it is resulting in the indoctrination, indoctrination and miseducation of our most influential young people. And I consider that catastrophic. I don't know about you. Uh, let me mention another one of the um, 
sins that you've committed. You invited noted white supremacist, quote unquote, Jared Taylor to lecture one of your classes and subjected your students to the presence of this fellow noted white supremacist in uh, the words of Dean Ruger. Um, and uh, thereby made them feel, in effect, unsafe, made them feel that they couldn't be trusted, uh, couldn't trust you, I should say, that you couldn't be trusted uh, to treat the students of color fairly. Um, what, what do you say to that concern, Amy? Well, first of all, Glenn, none of the students in my class complained. There were, you know, something like 10, 12 students at that session they asked really good questions. They uh, gave him a real hard time. Some of them engaged in discussions with him after the class. Uh, they had exchanges after the class. I mean, they aren't the ones complaining. Isn't that strange? They weren't traumatized. They weren't harmed. They weren't hurt. So think about that. The second thing is, Glenn, think about how utterly preposterous this objection is, how alarmingly stupid, okay? This is a class in conservative political and legal thought. One of the sessions was devoted to the historic and current far right, right in our nation, which is part of you know, conservatism properly understood. I mean, you right. could say that it's the far reaches of it, but it does right. exist. There is an organization called American Renaissance. There is a person named Jared Taylor. And you know that Jared Taylor is a fairly sophisticated and articulate spokesman for whatever point of view this far right supposedly represents. Now, when I ask the students, can you articulate to me what the belief system of these so-called white supremacist groups is, they can't tell me, they don't know, they are completely ignorant. So we have this thing, Glenn, called education. <laughs> and what is the purpose of education? To inform students, to enable them to understand what is going on, and specifically in this course, what is going on on the right end of the political spectrum, what people like Jared Taylor believe, what their positions are, what they want what they think about race and other issues that are pertinent to our nation's future. That is why Jared Taylor was invited. And here's the other thing. I asked you know, the law school, can I bring this speaker in and will you pay for a lunch? Yes, yes, all right. They didn't do their due diligence until after the fact. Wow, I didn't know that. You had already oh, yeah. asked and gotten consent to yes. bring him in on the school's dime. Yeah, and I because of COVID, I didn't bring him into the classroom because there was too much red tape. So I decided to have a luncheon in a nearby restaurant, which was actually a lot more fun. And we had a very good session and students learned something about the subject matter. So think about what Dean Ruger is saying. He's saying, we're going to have this Committee on Public Safety now at Penn, where we're going to review everything that students hear and what you assign for readings, because they also objected, you're not going to believe this, to my assigning an interview with Enoch Powell, who's a 20th century British conservative politician, yeah. known for yeah. his critique of, of third of world immigration. immigration. Yeah. Right. And, you know, who was a very sophisticated and articulate person and is well worth reading. That was also a, a basis for penalizing me too. I am going to be sanctioned because I had my students learn and read something about the subject matter of my course, which they voluntarily took. Think about that and think about the implications of that, Glenn. That's right. Yeah. No, I, I'm with you. Um, I'm not a fan of Jared Taylor in every respect. He and I have corresponded. He is what you say. He's intelligent. He's articulate. He's well read. He's thoughtful. He's also uh, a, a, a racial nationalist on my reading, a white nationalist uh, who is defending white people from what he takes to be the uh, undermining effects of the move that we've had over the last uh, half century toward, uh, you know, uh, greater inclusion and, and diversity and all of that. But Glenn, but nobody's he, asking you to agree with him. Yeah, I understand that. I, I accept your point. I understand. I, I mean, I have. I said to my students, 
you know, the fact that we're hearing from someone or reading something doesn't entail that you have to agree with it. I mean, you could say that about my whole course. But but you do, don't you agree to a great extent with Jared Taylor's uh, con some many of his concerns? That's a question. And if I'm wrong about it, tell me. I mean, you are to some degree sympathetic, are you not? to the racial realist kind of perspective about there being differences uh, between populations defined by race that are relevant to, to social outcomes. You have some sympathy, do you not, for the reaction that Jared Taylor is giving voice to, uh, to uh, all of the impositions that are being foisted uh, on white people, quote unquote, by, uh, by the diversocrats. Well, Glenn, let me ask you a question. How is that relevant to whether I should be fired for having my students learn about Jared Taylor's position and beliefs. How is that relevant, okay? I mean, I am still trying to figure out what Jared Taylor is actually saying. And, you know, Jared Taylor is, is someone I know. I've, I've socialized with him, I've talked to him, uh, and I am trying to nail down, you know, what his belief system is and what vision he entertains for the future of our country. I am still learning about that, you know, so I'm not sure whether I quote unquote agree with Jared Taylor. Uh, I am a race realist, but so are a lot of people. I mean, you know, so is Charles Murray. So is a bunch of people who study differences between populations and ethnicities and, and groups, anybody who studies uh, you know, psychometrics. I mean, there are there are dozens and dozens of people out there who sure. you could call race realists. I guess they all need to be banished from the university. Well, well some that's would a say so. Issue. You, some would say so. They would. Uh, the Southern well, Poverty Law Center would say so. But that's and, what I disagree with. Yeah. That is what I disagree with, and I take a stand against that. And once again, I'll go back to the question you asked. You know, it's interesting that your first impulse was to ask me, "Well, don't you agree with him?" And I would say, "Well." So, I mean, what difference does that make? I have them read dozens of people in my conservatism class. You could say, well, do you agree with this one? Do you agree with that one? Do you not agree with this one, that one? Who cares? I, I, my agreement or disagreement with any particular writer or theorist, and I can give you a laundry list of the people that we read in that class, you know, everyone from Edmund Burke to Michael Oakeshott, to Wilmore yeah. Kendall, to James Burnham, people, of course, our students have never heard of before, which is, sure. you know, in itself shocking. And they always say to me, wow, you opened my eyes to a whole nother world of thought, right. right? One that has been kept from me for 16 expensive, extravagant years and that I never knew existed. You know, what does my agreement or disagreement have to do with that? Well, I'm going to give you the answer that I think uh, would be forthcoming, which is that anybody who agrees with that threatens me. Anybody who thinks that there are natural differences between the races in intelligence passed on from generation by, to generation through heredity that are pertinent to accounting for the different occupational distributions under representation in the techie professions and so forth is a threat to me. Those ideas, those white supremacist ideas threaten me. They, they undermine my sense of security, not just in this university community, but in this nation. And those ideas need to be understood for what they are. They are racism. And we're against racism. We're anti-racist. We're committed to anti-racism here. That's the answer. That you're agreeing with Jared Taylor is relevant because Jared Taylor is beyond the pale uh, in the minds of so many. And you, to the extent that you're standing with him, you too are beyond the pale. You are behaving in a manner that's inconsistent with the values and the commitments of the university community. Uh, I could find a passage in Dean uh, Ruger's letter where he says as much, but that's, that's what I understand the indictment to be. Okay, well, Glenn, I'll ask you one question. You don't need to answer it, okay? Does it matter what's true or not true? You know, they call it race realism for a reason. And I'm not sitting here and telling you that I conclusively know, you know, what the sources of any differences, if any, are, because I don't conclusively know. Okay. But you know what? I am open-minded about it because I know that it is determined by facts 
that are beyond our wishes, our dreams, our hopes and our control, all right? So that's what it means to be a race realist. So we need to make a decision about whether the truth matters and that that is a very important decision. Now, apropos of that and related to that, you say, well, if you agree or think that that Jared Taylor is right about X and Y, and I'll leave aside the question of, you know, whether we even know what Jared Taylor really thinks, apart from what we imagine he thinks, if you agree with him, then you are a threat to me. But let me turn that around and say, if you conclusively establish that we cannot think X, regardless of whether it turns out to be true or not, you're a threat to me. Does anybody care about that threat to me? I will expand that, all right? People say, well, I'm offended. This is offensive. Fire her, fire her. You have to get rid of her. You know, Glenn, I'm offended every single day when I open up the New York Times, all right? <laughs> when I read the stuff that's out there in the mainstream yeah. media, I'm upset. I'm offended. I'm, I'm quote unquote harmed, which I think is, you know, bullshit, of course. It's a misuse of the term harm. Um, I am emotionally uh, discomfited. Uh, all of the stuff that the people on the left claim that people on the right inflict on them is inflicted in the same way on people on the right. But why do their emotions and reactions never count? And here's the thing, the fact that I read stupid, idiotic, deceitful, offensive things in the New York Times, all right, attacking people I know, and I know that these are half truths and lies, okay? I would never dream of saying, well, fire those people, get rid of them, cancel them, banish them, penalize them, punish them, because they wrote that stuff. That's no, that wouldn't cross my mind, right? So this I want to I want to answer your question. Yes, the truth matters, obviously. Otherwise, what the fuck are we doing? We're wasting our time. If the truth doesn't matter, if the university is in the propaganda business, then it please is. let me find another line of work because that's why I came. That's the reason I showed up was because I was interested in figuring this stuff out. So yes, the truth matters absolutely. Let me say another thing. Education matters, pedagogy. I want young people to be capable of standing their ground and articulating their reasoned defenses of the value positions that they adopt in life, including your students. So if somebody is confronted by you and Jared Taylor and they don't like, I don't know, racial realism, then let's hear from them. The point of the whole enterprise is to teach them how to be able to stand up and to defend what they believe in. So if we respond to their cowering, trembling, uh, uh, infantilizing uh, uh, impotency in the face of hearing from a person like you and Jared Taylor by saying to you and Jared Taylor, shut up, don't offend our students, we are absolutely abandoning um, our brief as professors to educate our charges. But, I mean, so I... I, I Agree with you. Well, I call that educational malpractice. I think what is going on in universities today, and I don't want to like completely indict them, although things, as, as a, a very prominent lawyer said to me the other day, things are bad, but they're worse than you think. I said, no, they can't possibly be worse than I think because I see it every day. Okay, they have become propaganda centers, I'm afraid to say, Glenn. And it's, it's, it's seeping into everything, okay? It's not just confined to, let's say, the humanities or the softer social sciences. It's now afflicting economics, your field, you know, which used to be a bastion of integrity. It's gone into the sciences, into STEM, into medicine. Ideology is front and center. I think it's especially alarming in the case of medical science, where we have been the shining light of the world and sort of the world leader, and, and that is, I think, being threatened. So yeah, you say, well, we should go into another line of work, but of course we have such a cushy birth and you know everything is easy street for people like us. That's part of the reason that nobody stands up to be counted. I can't tell you how many old white guys have said to me, and I've said this before, oh, wokeism is stupid, it's, it's idiotic, it's ideology, it's, 
destroying academia, blah, blah, blah. And I say, well, why don't you come out publicly and say that? Well, of course they're not gonna do that, right? They've got a great life. They've got all their friends on Martha's Vineyard or Nantucket or whatever. Yeah, uh, they're in Whiteopia, and they, they want to be invited to dinner parties. They want they to be, and so, and, and, and so do I, and so do I. Let me let me tell you a story, Amy. Uh, I think the first time I actually met you, I had known about you, but I actually met you was in the academic year 2010, 2011. I was on leave at Columbia University Economics Department, and I got invited by somebody to come and give a lecture at the University of Pennsylvania Law School because I was working with Bruce Western, the sociologist, on a um, project under the American Academy of Arts and Sciences rubric, uh, critiquing mass incarceration and its racially disparate effects. So I show up at the university, I have my charts and my graphs and whatnot, and I'm, I make my presentation and basically I'll be brief here. All I'm saying is, woe is me, woe is me. We got two and a quarter million people under lock and key jail and prison on a given day in the United States. Half of them are black and blacks are only 10% of the population. It's an outrage, it's outrage, it's outrage. I was very outraged, I was very passionate. And everywhere I had given that talk, the audience basically nodded along. I mean, not just at the Penn Law School, but in many different venues. And they, you know, yeah, yeah, too many people in prison. You know, the numbers had gone like that. And we need to do something about it. You stand up, Amy, and you say, no, <laughs> this is a paraphrase, but it's accurate. Quite the contrary, Professor Lowry. There are not too many blacks in prison. There are too few blacks in prison. That's practically a quote. You said it. I'll never forget it. Under okay. incarceration. <laughs> <laughs> Too few blacks in prison and you had an argument. I won't try to rehearse it. But the bottom line was I was outraged. I was just furious. Mm -hmm. uh, not that being embarrassed by somebody saying something that I thought I couldn't rebut because I thought I could rebut it. No, there are too many. You say too few. I say too many here. Let's have an argument. I'm, I'm quite willing <laughs> to argue. But at the at the I don't know, chutzpah. Uh, at, at the at the you know you broke the the code. We were all in it together until you stood up and said what it is that you said. You're, you're like the kid that says the emperor has no clothes. Um, I still don't think you were right in your claim, but I see it now in a very different light than I did before, especially after you know the Black Lives Matter stuff and the defund the police, the rising murder rates and the whatever whatever. I I see the point. The point is, if you have differences by race and the rates of offending against the law, you're going to have differences by race and the uh, numbers of people who are uh, subject to the punishment under the law. And by looking at racial differences in criminal offending, you calculate it. They're, quote unquote, too few, not too many. Um, that was a teaching moment for me. I mean, a learning moment uh, for me. But it was also the fury that I felt. And, I, and when I got back to my desk uh, in Morningside Heights, I pinned a letter to the dean of the law school. I don't know if it was Ruger in 2011, but to it somebody. It wasn't. Whoever it was, I said, this woman is a racist. I confess it. Um, so I can, <laughs> I can identify with the sense of uh, outrage. You've said, Amy, you have. There are too many Asian immigrants and that Asian immigration is not necessarily good for our country here in the United States. That created a furor. That's amongst the bill of indictment that the dean has, uh, has uh, issued against you. Um, in the same way that I felt in 2010, 2011, offended by someone who would contradict my views about incarceration by telling me that not enough black people in prison, a lot of people feel offended by your claim that Asian immigration needs to be uh, somehow limited or curtailed and it's bad for the United States going forward. And what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say this, there's the energy behind this crusade against you um, is, has, has a very deep grounding in our political culture. Uh, it, it, and, and I don't know, I want you to respond to that. I understand that, okay, but my position is that, you know, the the easy road, the easy route, and one that is increasingly taken uh, and, you know, is a form of, of, I think, decadence is to indulge that offense and to give in to it. And I, your own example illustrates why that is a bad idea. 
right? It's a bad idea because sometimes, you know, the important insights and the realities are upsetting. They are offensive. Uh, they do, uh, you know, give us, make us unhappy and give us pause. That is the nature of reality, but we have to see past that. And here's the other point I want to make, all right? When you go out there in the real world and talk to ordinary people, yeah. right? They talk about this stuff all the time, right? They, yeah. I mean, as often as not, and these are the people I hang out with, right? Because they're the people that contact me. I have a group of neighbors that get together. Uh, small business owners, you know, people who where the rubber meets the road and they yeah. have to deal with reality, right? Who don't think that it's wrong for there to be more blacks proportionately in jail because they say, hey, you know, this is a black city. Black crime is is skyrocketing. It's huge. And that's going to reflect the reality that crime rates simply aren't the same among different groups that follows naturally, right? And they have other critiques that you would never hear in the university. Oh, the other night I was at a party and there are a bunch of small business owners were complaining about civil rights laws and saying, you know, it's so hard to hire black people because if they don't work out, you always you get a lawsuit. It doesn't matter whether, you know, they should be fired or not. And of course, we always think they should be because that's why we fired them. Um, you know, here we are, small business owners. It really matters. It, it it really hurts when we get sued or when we have to keep on an employee who isn't really doing, isn't up yeah. to snuff. And, you know, that's why we really resent these laws. We, we understand their rationale, but they're being misused. They're being abused. Well, would that ever be discussed at, at an Ivy institution? No. Here's how those discussions go. Uh, well, not enough you know, not enough plaintiffs are winning these cases. More of them should win these cases, you know, as if that's just presumptively right, that these cases are meritorious, that it's racism, that they're losing these cases. That shows the racism of the court system. It doesn't yeah. show that, you know, these cases are being, being brought too often in, in situations where the person deserved to be fired. You know, uh, maybe they're not very good. Uh, is that possible? So we have what we're yes, doing yes. in academia, Glenn, is we are excluding uh, points of view that are commonplace in the real world. Uh, and we are essentially saying there are only certain opinions that can be had. And that is rightfully enraging to many people, many ordinary citizens who, by the way, are paying for these institutions. These institutions are private, oh, but they're getting billions of dollars of taxpayer yeah. money. You know, nurses and truck drivers and clerks are paying taxes so that we can fund these lavish, preening, self-regarding institutions who have nothing but contempt for most ordinary people who prattle on about democracy, but for whom democracy means the outcomes that we like, not what you know, people who vote for Trump want uh, that kind of hypocrisy is right. That's why. That's why I am on an advisory panel to the University of Austin, uh, the new uh, institution that is being stood up in Austin, Texas, which ten, which intends to model a very different vision of what the university can be, and I'm proud to be associated with it. I've only got a few minutes here, Amy. I, I want to give you an opportunity. I mean, I want to state. I want to state for the audience that. Um, I'm standing with my friend Amy Wax in her effort to defend herself against the outrageous assault upon her academic freedom, which this uh, judicial procedure within uh, the University of Pennsylvania represents. I'm standing with her. So there. I want you to tell uh, us in closing what you think can be done beyond the, your case. You hinted at that earlier. What should those of us who are deeply concerned about the future of the university uh, be trying to do? Okay, well, a few things. First of all, I have a GoFundMe, Amy Wax Legal Defense Fund. One of the things I've learned, Glenn, and I'm absolutely committed to staying the course here, is that people quit, retire, go away, 
because these universities are these BMOs, these deep pocketed BMOs, and they just wear you down. And one of the way they one of the ways they do that is the legal fees to defend yourself uh, are ginormous. So whatever you can give me, Amy Wax Legal Defend Fund, go fund me. Uh, that would be great. There are other avenues for contributing. Email me at my pen email, which is the easiest thing in the world to find, and I will tell you. The second okay. is I think donors, I think the biggest factor here would be if people who are shoveling money in the direction of these lavish, high-profile universities would stop doing that. I think the alumni have enormous power, and they are passive, they are craven, they're not really they don't really understand how bad things are. And obviously they want their kids to get into these places because this is the entree to the good life. Uh, so there's conflict of interest here, but stop giving to already rich universities and find some other use for your money. How about vocational institutions? We have the Williamson College of the Trades here in Philadelphia, outside Philadelphia, which is a wonderful institution. Think about giving to them. They train young men in all sorts of trades and vocational skills. That would be a better use of your money. The third thing is stand up and be counted. And here I am talking about people in education primarily. Boy, it would make such a difference if the tenured professors of America would recognize the threat to tenure that my case represents and how it is the nose under the tent of just eviscerating tenure. That is their goal. That is their project. Uh, they want to do that because they want to create an exclusive fiefdom in academia for far left thought. And I use the term far because statistically, the kind of woke ideology is only really embraced by about 10% of the population. Uh, this is their exclusive stronghold. And I really think people need to recognize that their sons and to some extent their daughters are going to be shut out of these institutions and these jobs uh, if they don't take action to broaden the range of opinions and viewpoints and people who participate in higher education and especially in elite higher education, which of course has outsized influence. And you know that, Glenn, because you're at yeah. an elite institution. We could be One talking about. Thing, okay. We okay. need a law. That's parallel to Title VI, which says no race discrimination if an institution accepts federal funds. Of course, it's not enforced to anywhere near the degree it should be. But we need a new law that says if you take federal funds, if you're even if you're a private, uh, a private university, you have to abide by the First Amendment. Simple law and aggressively enforced. And I hate to say this, with all their flaws, the Republicans, it's a Republican administration that's going to pass such a law and enforce such a law. And, you know, that's why I still vote for Republicans, because that's our last best hope. Well, that rules you, that rules you out of respectable company in the academy <laughs> right there. Let me explain, if I get it, the reason that law is necessary is that the First Amendment constrains the behavior of public Exactly. Government actors, but it doesn't necessarily apply to the private sector. And you want to uh, extend it to that. again? Let me, OK, so we're going to close, Amy, because I got to go. Uh, this has been an hour plus and you have had ample opportunity to defend yourself. I, I don't agree with everything you say. If that needs to be stated, I do not. Uh, people who want to hear me and you debate can go into their archives at glennlowry.substack and they can find, you know, uh, us arguing about all manner of things. But I definitely agree with you that you have a right uh, to stand for what you stand for and say what you believe without being condemned uh, and punished uh, because of the opinions that you, uh, that you voice. Uh, and that's the most chilling thing to me about this process against you at Penn. In effect, you're politically incorrect in your views and uh, you're being... Uh, pilloried for that. And, and that is an outrage and it's a threat to the integrity of everything that we're doing at the university. So that said, I thank you for your time and wish you the best. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You're welcome.